All right, take your Bible this evening if you would please, and let's go to the book of Jonah. We're going to start a study of the book of Jonah. Jonah is one of those books that I believe I have preached from on many occasions through the years, but I've never taken a Wednesday night and gone through the book of Jonah. And I, after preparing this first lesson, maybe I realized why I didn't know where to stop. Uh, I'm not sure how far we're going to get or how much we'll cover. We'll just kind of go as long as our time allows us, and then uh, we'll hopefully get through your paper that you have before you tonight, but there's a lot of ground to cover when we look at the book of Jonah. Jonah. Jonah 1 and verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our Scripture here this evening. And Lord, as we undertake the, to begin to study this book of Jonah and really the, the life of Jonah, as it's revealed for us here uh, in his book. Lord, I'm praying you'll give us the wisdom we need to uh, apply the Word of God and to rightly divide your Word. And Lord, that the Spirit of God would take these truths and bring them home to our heart. That Lord, it would be profitable and helpful for us to glean from the life of Jonah. Lord, I'm praying that you'll help us tonight as I bring the study, help each one as they listen. And may the Holy Spirit be our teacher tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we start off by asking the questions, some questions. Who was Jonah? Let me say, first of all, Jonah was a real person. Okay? Uh, not, not some pretend story or some pretend character. He was a real person. In fact, did you know that Jonah was mentioned somewhere else in the Bible? Uh, look at 2 Kings chapter 14, would you please? Go back to your left in your Bible to 2 Kings and look with me at chapter 14. Second Kings 14, verse number 25 says, He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant, who church? Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath-Hefer. So just to make sure it's the same Jonah, mentions his daddy and mentions where he's from. Okay, So he's a prophet. He's, he's ministering or prophesying here during the reign of Jeroboam the son of Joash, puts it in the right time. Nineveh, Joppa, and Tarsus are all real places that are in existence today. They existed then and they still exist today. Nineveh today is modern day Mosul, M-O-S-U-L in Iraq. And so you can know these places are real. Now I want you to go to the New Testament. Keep your finger in Jonah there so you can find it again. But look in the New Testament. Jesus affirmed the story of Jonah. Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12. You say, you really think that, you know, th this whole big fish story about Jonah? Yeah, I guess if Jesus believed it, it's okay for me to believe it. Amen? And Jesus, J Matthew chapter 12, notice with me at verse 41, when Jesus said, uh, let's start at verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. And so Jesus lets us know uh, that he, Jonah was indeed in the belly of the whale for three days and and listen, I won't argue with you. Somebody says, oh, it never says it was a whale. In Jonah, it doesn't say it's a whale. But I guess if Jesus calls it one, then I guess we are safe to call it one. Amen? 
and it's okay. So uh, he calls Jonah a prophet, and he calls him here that he was, without a doubt, uh, three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. And I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I've got a God who can make the sun stand still uh, for up to a day if he wants to. Uh, we have a God that can uh, part the Red Sea. We have a God that can raise folks from the dead. We have a God that can make the crippled to walk and the, 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 the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. And uh, it's nothing for him to put a man inside the belly of a whale for a few days. Uh, we have a God who can do that. And so I believe the, the story of Jonah really happened. I think what we're going to be studying about and learning about is something that absolutely uh, took place. It's not uh, a metaphor. It's reality. Okay? Now, uh, sometimes we, people wonder who wrote the book of Jonah, and nobody really knows for certain. Um, but I think probably it was written by Jonah himself. And uh, there's, you, you have some very personal information about Jonah when he was in the belly of the whale. And uh, the only one who might be privy to that would be Jonah himself. And uh, so he shares that. Uh, and, I, and I think as we hear about his attitudes and we know what he was thinking and what he was feeling like, uh, God probably uh, allowed him to write his own book. Now, we're going to see several spiritual themes when we go through Jonah. Just kind of giving you an overview of the book here this evening a little bit. And we'll, we'll touch a little bit as we begin the story. Uh, but we'll really get into the story full steam next Wednesday night. But I believe there's several spiritual themes in Jonah. There's a theological theme. And what I'm saying is there's a difference between God and man. God is gracious. God is long-suffering. God is righteous. Man is selfish. Man is hard-hearted. Man is cruel. You see, we understand something from the Bible. Man, by nature, is not good. That the whole problem with the humanist philosophy is we think Man is ba they think man is basically good. And so if you just educate him and give him the right information, he'll choose the good thing. Well, man doesn't do that. Man, all you do is you make man an educated sinner. Okay? We are, we are all born with a sin nature. And you know that, and if you're a parent, you know that. Uh, you never had to teach your children to be selfish. You never had to teach those little boy, a little girl to grab a toy and say, Mine! <laughs> or to get upset when someone else takes the toy they wanted. Uh, you didn't teach that to them. That was in them. And so, it were born that way. So we see the difference between God and man. We see the difference between man and creation. Several times in Jonah, you'll see God ordering His creation. He ordered that whale to swallow Jonah. And that whale obeyed. He ordered that whale to spit him back up, and he did. He did exactly what God told him to do. But you also see man rejecting what God told him to do. Refusing to do what God told him to do. Because man has been given a free will. And man can ultimately reject God. And we see that, the difference between man and creation. We see... We see God's sovereignty and man's free will. We see God's sovereignty and man's free will. God calls. Man rejects. God pursues. Man repents. God, God overrules the disobedience of man. He worked with Jonah's disobedience by getting in the ship and heading the opposite direction to still accomplish his purpose. And so God, don't ever think that anything man does is going to thwart the purpose of God. God is able to overrule that even though He gives us that free will. There's a prophetic theme in Jonah. There's Jonah, Jonah was probably, like I said, written by him. It was written at the end of his years as a warning to Israel. Israel was to be a light to the other nations. There would be a testimony to other nations about their God. And if they, if they don't live up to that purpose, God will exile them for a while, which He ended up doing 
in Babylon for 70 years so that they would again be a light to the nation. I think it's prophetical. It's interesting. Jonah is one of the few prophets. It's one of the, he's a fifth minor prophet. But, but his book is one of the ones that only, he really only contains one prophecy, and that is 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown if you don't repent. Everything else is about his life and his, his call and his refusal to go. It's all about him and his, his working. None of the other prophets, all the other prophets, all the other minor prophets is about their prophecy, what they said. This is all about what Jonah did and what he didn't do in his life. So it is prophetic. And then it also is redemptive. Jonah pictures redemption. Jonah, uh, in fact, Jesus pointed to Jonah as three days and three nights in the belly of fish. Even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Just as Jonah was brought back to life, so to speak, and spit out on dry ground, the Lord Jesus came out of the grave after three days and three nights. And brought, God brought him back from the dead. And remember, Jesus said, a better than Jonah is here. And so he lets him know that. Now, I mentioned this just a minute ago, but there's a uniqueness to Jonah and the book of Jonah. His story is uh, more about the prophet than the words of the prophet. His prophetic words are very few. Now, Jonah is not the only prophet to think about abandoning his call. He's the only prophet that really did abandon his call. But Elijah struggled. Do you remember when he was under the juniper tree and just said, God, go ahead and kill me. I'm done. <laughs> uh, uh, we know that Jeremiah struggled. We mentioned it the other night. He just uh, wanted to go out in the country and get himself a uh, a room and just leave, leave me alone and I'm not going to talk anymore about God or not going to speak anymore in His name. And uh, he was ready to just call it quits. Uh, he couldn't do it. And his word was a fire in his bosom and he had to speak. And uh, nobody, nobody turned away except Jonah. Now the question is, why did God call Jonah? Interesting. Now, for this, I want you to go back to 2 Kings 14, will you? Where we first met the first mention of Jonah here, 2 Kings 14. And I'll give you a little bit of background of what's going on here and, and why God would call Jonah. When you go back to 2 Kings 14, back up and let's get in about verse number 23. In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned forty and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath under the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord, God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah. So he restored the coast of Israel from the ending of Hamath to the sea of the plain. He expanded their kingdom. Now how did he do that? At the word of the prophet Jonah. Jonah had a great prophecy here. He had given a message from God to, to uh, expand Israel's borders all the way to Damascus. That's where Hamath was. And so it really was, it was the peak, it was the zenith of the northern kingdom's reign. At the, the peak of their power. And so uh, there, at a time, a time when Syria was a cause of concern for Israel, but God raised up a prophet named Jonah who would prophesy to Israel that they're going to have a great victory. In fact, not only have a great victory, they'll expand their borders and they'll grow even greater. Well, that's good news. Hey, everybody likes it when the, when the, when the word is uh, you're going to expand, you're going to grow. Everybody likes it when, when the, somebody says there's going to be more money in your pocket, you know, and things are going to be good for you and things are going to expand. And so uh, that, that's, that was Jonah. And, and so uh, Jonah becomes sort of a national hero. 
Uh, this is, hey, uh, this happened because Jonah said it was going to happen. And uh, thanks, Jonah. Man, we like you. Everybody likes somebody who makes it a good life for them and puts money in their pocket. And so he became a pretty well-esteemed prophet of God. And, and it's interesting, this little place that mentions Gath-Hefer. Gath-Hefer is, is a little itty-bitty place near Nazareth. You remember what they said about Jesus? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, that's where Jonah came from. That same area. That was the wrong side of town, so to speak. But now, he's, he's got national acclaim. Uh, he's, getting, he's, he's the hero. Everybody likes Jonah, and, and everybody knows who he is. He's well known. He's the prophet that said we would, God would bless us, and we'd expand, and we'd have victory over enemies, and it's happened, just like he said it would. The problem is, in their prosperity, as so often was the case with especially Israel, the northern kingdom, they forgot God. It says they continued in the sins of Jeroboam, which was he set up false gods and all over the, the nation, and, and they, they worshipped idols. And so they embraced all those false gods. There was much moral and spiritual decadence throughout the land. And it was a, it seemed like they were all getting away with it. It seemed like, hey, hey, you ever, you ever experience that? Do something wrong in your life and you wait for the lightning to hit and it doesn't hit and you think, oh, well, I guess it must be okay. Hasn't happened. Nothing's happened. And that's how Israel was feeling. They think God didn't notice. How many understand that God always notices? Do you understand that uh, I was it, He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, never misses anything. The other night I came to bed and my my wife is an Olympic freak. All right, and uh, she just, she doesn't want to miss anything, you know. Uh, I cannot tell you the nights that, is she in here? I can't <laughs> tell you. I can't tell you the nights I, I wake up and there she is watching the Olympics and it's 11 o'clock, 11.30. I'm like, man, you got to be kidding me. And uh, the other night I came to bed and she was asleep. The TV was on, you know, what the Olympics were on. And she wakes up and she goes, oh. She said, I'm waiting for some skier. Doesn't I stay awake until right before she gets up and I fell asleep. I wake up and it's over. And I missed, I missed who I wanted to see. See, she nodded off and missed something. Did you know God never nods off? God never misses anything. No, no chance of getting by with anything with God. So during that same time, during the same time, contemporary with Jonah was, was uh, the book of Amos. They, he was prophesying during that time. Joel, Hosea, all of them warning Israel of their sin against God. Nobody listened to them. So here's Jonah. So listen, though, though it's spiritually a bad time, though they're worshiping idols, other than them being away from God, Everybody's happy because it's prosperous. They've expanded their land. They're more powerful than they ever have been. They, they don't have need of anything. The economy's moving along. And everybody's happy. And, and they, they, they think life is just grand. And here he is. A time of great blessing. A national hero for his accurate predictions of this time of prosperity for Israel. And the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. And he says, I want you now go to Nineveh. Now I'm sure Jonah said, Lord, I like that first mission real well. I don't care for this one. I mean, tell Israel they'll be successful. Tell Israel they'll be prosperous and life will be grand. Hey, I like that message. Lord, I like telling that message. I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to do that. And sometimes we can be just like that with God, can't we? When God tells us something we want to do, hey, we're good with that. But when God tells us to do something we don't want to do, 
then we're ready to say, God, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I, I'll, I'll be like Jonah and I'll just go the other way. God, God calls us to do some hard things. Not just all the easy things. The call of God on our life is not just about doing the easy missions. It's about doing the hard missions. So we're going to understand why it was difficult for Jonah to go to Nineveh. Because that's our next question. Who is Nineveh? What is Nineveh? Who are the Ninevites? Well, when Israel expanded their borders to the south, they captured much of Syria, which was to the north and to the west. Assyria was their biggest threat. Now, Assyria and Syria are different. Assyria was a growing power, and the capital of Assyria was Nineveh. Hosea, if you read the book of Hosea, he predicted that they would be the instrument of God's wrath upon Israel. In fact, many times in Jonah even, when it talks about Nineveh, it's, it calls it a great city. It was a great city. It was a, a Syria rising power. But the Assyrians were a brutal people. Wicked. Cruel. They were known for their grossness and their brutality. They were completely and totally godless. They were especially brutal to their enemies. From the writings and records of their own rulers, we can find some account of their atrocities. They would always cut the heads off enemy soldiers and stack them up in piles outside of their city. They'd skin their captors and then they would hang the skin on the city walls. They'd torture any prisoners of war they got by cutting off their hands, and then they would gut them. They burned infants and children alive, infants and women alive. So, Nahum, in fact, Nahum calls Nineveh the city of blood. Imagine some of the worst butchers in history, such as Hitler, Mao Zedong, Stalin. Imagine just uh, some of the worst atrocities we think of and you can get a somewhat of an idea of who the Assyrians were. They would have been the modern, they, they'd have been the ISIS of our day. Just as a side note, it's interesting since we've had the, the administration now for a little over a year in office, we haven't heard anything about ISIS. Isn't that interesting? No videos, no YouTube, nobody getting cut up, burnt, nothing. Interesting. But I digress. Jonah, Jonah's hometown would have been on the, one of Israel's northern borders and so Jonah could have seen firsthand what the Assyrians did. Some of the things that they did to enemies. Some have thought that maybe they might have killed and tortured and done some of these things to Jonah's family members. Maybe they were brutally tortured by those people. So they were the enemy. Not only that, Nineveh, as we said, a great city, a massive city, but it was considered impenetrable. It had an inner and an outer wall around Nineveh. The inner wall was 50 feet wide and 100 feet tall. Pretty good fortress. Now, Jonah, leave the prosperity, leave the blessing, leave where everybody thinks you're a hero and you're a great guy and you're nationally acclaimed. Leave all that, go 500 miles, and be a missionary to the enemy of Israel. Risking your life at what anybody who you, who you tell that to would tell you, you're on a suicide mission. They'll certainly kill you. I mean, what, wasn't God asking Jonah to do something impossible? 
That's what people would have told him. If not impossible, it's crazy. Dangerous. But God said, go. Go. You see, God hadn't ignored Nineveh's evil. God hadn't looked the other way. Just because they didn't acknowledge God doesn't mean God didn't acknowledge what they were doing. And just because America isn't acknowledging God doesn't mean God isn't acknowledging what America is doing. In fact, we read tonight, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. That little word evil. We're going to see exactly what God thinks about things that are evil. So Jonah sees quite an impossible mission. What Jonah didn't see, and, and, and what, what oftentimes we don't see when God asks us to do the hard thing. When God asks to do something that we look at it on the surface, we look at it this way and say, that's impossible. It would be, it'd be like God calling you saying, you need to go to Al-Qaeda. You need to go to the, to the uh, ISIS or the Muslim and you need to win them to Christ. Sure. What Jonah didn't see was how God was working in the hearts of the Ninevites. He had no idea. Can God, can God work in darkened, sinful, evil, calloused hearts? Yes. Yes, He can. We're told that He, we're told in the, in, that he holds the heart of the king in His hand and as the rivers of water, He can turn it any way He wants. God can do that. You see, at that time, Assyria was at a time of weakness. What they didn't know, what Jonah didn't know, was Assyria had just experienced two countrywide plagues. At the same time, right at this time that Jonah's called, they had experienced a total eclipse of the sun. In their culture, that meant that was divine anger of the gods to them. So Jonah coming and preaching the message to repent would meet them at exactly the right moment and hit them right at the right time. You see, so often when we refuse to do the hard thing, it's because our view of God is too small. We don't see how big God is. We only see the evil or the impossibility or the sheer size of the task at hand and we don't see how big God is. God was setting things up for revival in Nineveh. In fact, I think about, when I thought about this, we're going to be talking about Rahab in Sunday school on Sunday morning. But uh, go back with me to the book of Joshua, will you please? Joshua chapter 2. When... Back in the book of Numbers, when they sent the 12 spies in to spy out the land. Remember, uh, uh, 10 of them came back and they said, eh, can't do it. There are too many people and they are not only too many, they are too big. There are giants in there, man. In fact, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. They are huge. They have chariots of iron. There is no way we can do it. Said in, in our sight, they're in, in their sight, we're grasshoppers, and in our sight, they're giants. They never ever considered God's sight. Two did, Joshua and Caleb. But the other thing they never considered, here they are, they never considered, hey, God told us to take the land, God will give us the ability to do it, but what they never thought about was, what is God doing on that side? What is God doing with them? Forty years go by. 
I don't know how many people died, but there's a bunch of them. Everybody who was 20 and upward, they all died in the wilderness. They, they went around in circles for 40 years till everybody died who would not go in except Joshua and Caleb. Now, 40 years goes by. They come back in. Joshua's leading them in now. He sent two guys in to lay, get the lay of the land and to bring a report back. And they go into the house of Rahab. And she hides them. Okay? Once the, the men come, she says, no, they're not here. And she's got them hit up on the roof. And they go away. She has a conversation with them. Let's look at that conversation. Verse 8. Joshua 2, verse 8. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. Now we're talking Jericho. And that your terror is fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites, which were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard those things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man. Because of you, for the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Could they have gone in 40 years earlier and taken it? Absolutely. You know why? They were all afraid of them. They didn't realize it. God is not just preparing you. He's preparing them for the work that He wants you to do. Wow. You see, the story of Jonah is much more than just the story of Jonah. It's a story of God working through an ungodly prophet. But it doesn't stop there. It's God working through an ungodly nation. The central character in the book of Jonah isn't Jonah. It's God. Just like the central person in the book of Esther wasn't Esther. And it wasn't Mordecai. It was God. God's at work. Newscaster Paul Harvey told the story about God's providential care over thousands of Allied prisoners during World War II. One of America's mighty bombers took off from the island of Guam and headed for Kokura, Japan with deadly cargo because clouds covered the target area. The B-29 circled for nearly an hour until its fuel supply reached a danger point. The captain and his crew, frustrated because they were right over the primary target, yet not able to fulfill their mission, finally decided they better go for a secondary target. Changing course, they found that the sky was clear. So the command was given, bombs away. After unloading their bombs, they headed for their home base. But it was some time later when an officer received some startling information from military intelligence. Just one week before that bombing mission, the Japanese had transferred one of their largest concentrations of captured Americans to the city of Kokura. Upon reading this, the officer exclaimed, Thank God for that protecting cloud. If the city hadn't been hidden from the bomber, they would have killed thousands of American soldiers by bombing that city. Many American boys would have died. You see, God is at work. He works behind the scenes, but He moves. He not only works behind the scenes, He moves all the scenes He's behind. <laughs> he works. We have to let, allow Him to work. Jonah just wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. Kill him. See, if, if you're not careful, you can let patriotism get in the way of your Christianity. The patriot side of an, being American says, wipe them out. Let's just kill them. They're the enemy, let's kill them all. But God says, 
they need the gospel. They need to be saved. When, they, when I bring them here to you, why in the big picture, why would God allow them to come to America? As a, as a, as a patriotic American, you know what you'd say? They're going to take over. Man, they're going to take this place over. We need to kill them. We need to wipe them out. Don't let them more in. As a Christian, you say, what an opportunity God has given to us. He's bringing them to us. We need to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid. You don't know what God's doing in their heart. Speak to them. God, God's only going to help you. He's working in them. Don't let your patriotism outweigh your spirituality. We're going to learn from Jonah that obedience isn't optional with God. One important, one, something that's interesting, it's not in your notes or anything, is that I found out in reading that on in the Jewish synagogues on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, a passage from Jonah is always read. And the congregation responds with these words, We are Jonah. Hmm. This book is about us. It's, it's a lot like a mirror. And sometimes we don't like what we see. Because we are Jonah. Sometimes in our disobedience. Sometimes in our insensitivity to others. Sometimes with our dissatisfaction with what God has done or how God works. We're not happy with what God just did. Selfishness. But it also helps us see that God is patient and God is forgiving. Jonah just wanted Nineveh to get what they deserved. So he disobeys. He doesn't go. Wow. All right. Why, why didn't he go? Why didn't Jonah obey? Well, number one, perhaps he was afraid of the Assyrians. I understand that. Remember how cruel they were and what they did to people who they, they, they would conquer? I don't think I had any desire to add my head to the stack outside the gate of the city, you know. You can see my head on top of the pyramid there. So I understand. Others think that Jonah was proud. He didn't want God's mercy to go to Nineveh. He knew, that's why he got disgusted later on, we'll find out in chapter 4, was because he knew God would be merciful to them and forgive them if they repented. Number three, he may not have gone because he, he really didn't think Israel would repent until they saw God judge another nation. And who better to see him judge than Nineveh? Maybe they wouldn't repent until they saw God deal with somebody else and then they'll say, well, we don't want that to happen to us. Maybe we'll better repent. But maybe... Fourthly, he feared that God would use Assyria to judge Israel. And by the way, that's what God ended up doing. Assyria would cause Israel much grief. But you know what? None of that matters because God told him to go. Why we disobey isn't nearly as important as the fact that we disobey. Now, give you some a little bit of geography here. We're going to try and get through this quickly here at the end. Joppa is 30 miles northwest of Jerusalem. 30 miles northwest. He went to Joppa to get in a ship. Nineveh was 600 miles to the northeast. Tarshish, where he wants to go to, 2,000 miles west. About as far away from 600 miles northeast you can get. Exact opposite direction. 
thinking, and we'll talk more about this maybe next week, that he'd flee from the presence of the Lord. Can you imagine how foolish that is? There's something about the presence of the Lord you don't want to be without. You don't want to be without. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. There's an outline of the book of Jonah. It's, uh, the chapter 1 is the prodigal prophet. Chapter 2 is the praying prophet. Chapter 3 is the preaching prophet. Chapter 4 is the pouting prophet. I won't, I'd like to spend more time on this last part, but I'll try to just get through it for you. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. That's such an important phraseology there that God gave. You see, it's, it was only the word of the Lord that came to Jonah that gave Jonah any credence. It wasn't his word. It was the fact that the Lord gave him the word. A word from God was an authoritative word. It's invested with divine power and it always came to pass. In Israel, a prophet, if you spoke something and it didn't come to pass, you're done. You'd put to death. You had to speak the words of God. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 are verses where God said, My my word that goes forth out of my mouth will accomplish. It will not return to me void. It will accomplish which I please. It will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God's word. Mary's statement to the angel, Be it unto me according to thy word. She knew that everything God speaks comes to pass. The Bible is invaluable because it's about God. It's valuable because it's the Word of God. It is the words of God. The church, the church is valuable in the community and valuable in the world as long as it's in the place of His presence and it proclaims His Word. The church has lost its influence in our world the church has lost its influence in our country because she stopped proclaiming His Word. We have to proclaim the Word of God. That's where the authority... Where do we go for authority? Where do we go for a word of authority? A word that goes beyond man's intellect. A word that will cause men's heart to burn like those on the road to Emmaus when Jesus spoke to them. All things in that Moses and the prophets and the Psalms wrote concerning him. The psalmist said, The words of the Lord are pure words like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The psalmist said that the word of the Lord is better to him than thousands of gold and silver. Do we really believe that? I wonder how many American Christians have given the choice of a, of a Bible here and a pile of gold and silver there would say, you know what, I think I'll just keep this right here. Hmm? Apart from the Word of the Lord, you know what we do? We run to cunningly devised fables, as Peter tells us. We run to philosophy, false teachers. False prophets. But Paul said when he wrote to Timothy, he said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts will heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll turn away their ears from the truth. Truth is the Word of God. And we'll turn our ears away from that. Don't tell me, thus saith the Lord, tell me what I want to hear. That's where we are. Look, turn over and we'll be done to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Will you please? 2 Timothy chapter 3. You okay? 
We're almost there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Thanks for turning there and listening. You know, he said in the last days perilous times will come. He said in the last days there will be evil men and seducers and they're going to grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Notice verse 13 of chapter 3, 2 Timothy. He said, Timothy, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, what's the answer? Verse 14, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. What's the remedy for the malady? The Word of God. The Word of God. Continue thou in the Word of God. Our security and our safety is in the Word of God. The truth of God. Knowing it, hearing it, heeding it. More valuable than silver or gold. It loses its value when we hear it and we do not heed it. When we hear it and we do not do it. Do you value the Word of God? It's, it's, it's difficult. We have so many other things to take us away from. We have so many other shiny objects to grab our attention. The power is in the Word of God. The Word of the Lord came to Jonah. It was 1930s in Russia. Stalin had ordered that all the Bibles be confiscated. Christian believers were sent to prison camps. But ironically, most of the Bibles were not destroyed. Yet many Christians died as enemies of the state. When the USSR dissolved, a commission team arrived in Russia in 1994 in a place called Stavropol. Their request to have Bibles shipped to Moscow was being held up. But someone told them about a warehouse outside of town where confiscated Bibles were still stored. Remarkably, the team was granted permission to distribute them. They hired several local Russian workers and began to load their trucks. One young man, a hostile agnostic, came only for the day's wages. But it wasn't long after they started loading the trucks that he disappeared. Upon searching, they found him in the corner of, a, of the warehouse, weeping, a Bible in his hands. Intending to steal one for himself, he picked up his own grandmother's Bible off the shelf. Her signature was on the front page. And that young Russian, was transformed by the very Bible his grandmother was persecuted for. The power of the Word of God. God's always at work. Now we'll look next week at Jonah fleeing from God. Okay, This is all just kind of background uh, information, but uh, we'll get into some of the heart of the story here when we get together next Wednesday night. All right, Let's stand together, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for everyone's attention tonight. Lord, I'm praying, God, that we'll learn how authoritative Your Word is. And that we want to be doers of the Word, not hearers only. Help us, Lord, to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Lord, help us always to do what You tell us to do. Dismiss us now with Your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place, please. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, the joy of the Lord is my strength. One more time tonight, all right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible battles and I love my church. I go to Bible battles and I love my church. I go to Bible battles and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up. <laughs>